use in your Zoom rooms. Um, I'm Shelby Reynolds. I'm the Assistant Director for Instructional Technology and Library Services. And my co-host today is Pete Connors. He's the Instructional Tech Coordinator for the East Region. Um, uh, Pete's gonna be monitoring chat just to make sure that if folks have questions that those get answered in a timely fashion or that they're brought to the attention of, of Pete and myself so that we can answer them in um, person. And with that, here we go. Uh, the things we're gonna cover today include <laughs> a recent trend called Zoom bombing, which is not my favorite thing to talk about, but is an important thing for us to be aware of. Uh, to prevent Zoom bombing and other miscreant behavior, we're also gonna be talking through the meeting settings that you have available to you within your Zoom account. We're gonna do a quick uh, re recap of digital citizenship and some expectations that you should be reinforcing with your students. And also, uh, we're going to give you some suggestions for classroom management in the Zoom platform so that um, if all things are set up properly in the beginning and you've done all your steps for prevention, if anything goes awry, um, those classroom management strategies should help you deal with, you know, ill behavior in the moment. So Zoom bombing, um, if you read my emails yesterday or you've paid attention to any blogs or social media posts, uh, Zoom bombing unfortunately has become a thing. Um, it, this is known as the act of breaking into a Zoom meeting that you're not supposed to be into, um, taking over the screen or using chat or other methods to just basically disrupt a meeting or disrupt a class. It can vary widely. It can be anything from putting stupid nonsensical junk in the chat to taking over a screen and showing pornography or other obscene messages. Um, it can be, you know, name calling and slurs. Um, it can be a number of things. And we'll talk about some of those examples in just a minute. But this is the thing that we're trying to prevent by changing those meeting settings within Zoom. You might wonder how are folks doing this? How are Zoom bombers getting into meetings? Um, one thing that folks are doing, bad guys are doing out there, is they're guessing meeting IDs. Um, if you have you know, paid attention to the IDs that are created when you create a Zoom room, classroom, whatever, you'll know that it's a, it's a set number of characters. And there are people who are, I guess, are bored enough to go out there and start, you know, trying to join rooms with random numbers. Um, and if your meeting is not protected with a password or other kinds of um, security measures, then it'd be very easy for somebody to enter your room and um, do terrible things. There are also um, news reports that suggest that people are out there building bots that are going out on the web and looking for meeting IDs so that um, they're out sniffing and that bot will return to the, the bad guy a meeting room that they can join that's open. And this is not great, especially when we're talking about education and student privacy. So it's really important that we're taking every measure that we can to secure our classrooms and um, prevent these kinds of things from happening. Um, early on when we started our distance learning um, in the first week, a couple of weeks ago, we um, hope that you heard the message loud and clear that you should not be posting your Zoom room URLs publicly. If you have a Google site or you have posted materials to your school's website, these, these are potentially public ways for people to get the URLs for your classrooms. So you should only be publishing URLs for Zoom rooms within secure environments like Google Classroom, through emails, through Synergy, or direct emails to families, or within Seesaw, for example. These are all closed environments that the public doesn't have access to. And this is um, one way that you can share those URLs without exposing yourself to um, the bad guys. And then um, another way that folks are getting in is to use personal meeting IDs. Those uh, personal meeting IDs are the, and they're customizable, but they're sort of the generic anytime room that's created uh, within your account. And if you don't take precautions like using the waiting room or setting a password on your personal meeting room or locking the room once the participants have entered, um, those personal meeting IDs might be published in a number of places that could have been shared, right? So if you've used your personal meeting ID as your open office hours every week and that uh, URL always stays the same, then it is possible for people to share that URL with people that shouldn't have access to it. 
So there are some precautions you can take that we will go through to help you understand um, how to set up a password, how to use the waiting room, and how to lock the room. Um, again, some examples, some things that we're trying to prevent include hijacking um, your screen, displaying you know, pornographic or other obscene content, um, annotating over somebody else's share. We had some reports of this uh, late in the week before last where kids were taking over annotations and drawing inappropriate shapes on Google slide decks and things like that. Um, using chat inappropriately is also not good digital citizenship and there are kids doing that as well, as well as you know, outside people that get access. Um, using backgrounds uh, and inappropriate stuff you know, as virtual backgrounds is another way kids, are, kids and adults in some cases are causing disruptions. Um, using chats to bully, harass, or back channel heckle, which is basically like um, a back channel is just a way to have sort of a private conversation while a public presentation is happening. Um, and that's no good. Using personal chat to do that is not a good idea. And then hijacking audio and uttering verbal slurs, foul language, or insults. That has happened a couple of times too. And that is one of the reasons why I was muting, I was careful to mute all as you guys were entering the room as um, I will continue to do throughout the presentation as will Pete, just to make sure that people are muted. So um, without further ado, we're gonna jump in and Pete's gonna take over the screen sharing so that he can um, adjust uh, show you how to adjust the settings for best security. Um, the captions that are at the top of the screen are coming from Google Slides, so that's gonna, that captioning will stop. Um, but Pete and I actually learned something today that we're gonna test and see if it helps us um, be, you know, make our content more accessible, and that is um, we're gonna be looking for a transcript for Zoom to create a transcript of our presentation. So um, more to come on that. But you're going to see the captions go away. You're going to see the um, prevention slide go away, and Pete's going to take over. And if anyone needs transcripts in this session, um, maybe just let us. Like, if you need closed cap, or I guess we could say that in the chat. Um, yeah, I won't worry about putting closed captions on mine unless we hear otherwise. So, and then Shelby, there are still people arriving late into the okay. waiting room. So. I'm admitting. Thank you. Check my share one more time. Yep, great. Okay, so we should be seeing our settings here. And this is the, where we're going to adjust our settings for our default um, is in the website version. And I think it's worth, I know there's been, we've had a lot of chats with folks in our consults in the STS chat about uh, settings in the desktop app versus settings in the, uh, in the website. And just know that the website settings are generally more there's more detail they go deeper they set the defaults for what happens in all of your meetings so it's a powerful place to go and get acquainted with all the settings that are there and what well, that's exactly what we're going to do right now so when i'm talking about the website I'm, i mean zoom.us and when i go to zoom.us i'm going to have to sign in unless i'm sure most of us are already signed in right now you'll go to my account it should drop you into your profile. And then it, within your profile, if you scroll down to see settings. And here you'll end up with a very long list that's broken out by these bookmarks of all the settings that apply to you in, uh, in Zoom. They have three tabs. The vast majority of them are under meeting. And then there are some under recording and telephone. Uh, we'll start off in meeting and telephone we don't really use recording. There's a few things there. So if you're not seeing these bookmarks, it might be, it all has to do with how your screen is sized. So if you have, uh, you know, just make sure you're looking at this with a full screen because those bookmarks are really useful. 
But when you watch our webinars, you'll see us jump between those as we go. But let's just head down this list and you can see that schedule meeting, that's this first heading and we can kind of jump between them using those bookmarks. But as we head down this, I just want to highlight some of the ones that I have checked uh, and encourage you to, you know, or give you some thoughts about using those uh, if that's the way you want to go. Uh, I'm using the PMI for when, I, when I'm scheduling, especially quick meetings. Um, if you do or don't want to do that, you'll notice that as I go down my settings, I also use the weight room. Uh, personally, I do lock rooms after I'm like once I've started them. So I feel comfortable using my PMI for that kind of thing. Um, by all means, that's a, a box that you'd want to uncheck or probably is off by default if you want to be using unique, uh, unique instances. ahead of time like or say ahead of time that students or folks need to sign in it's something to consider if you're going to breakout rooms or something like that but for the most part that can be something that's unchecked that just means they have accounts um, I think it is worth you know if your students do create accounts especially based on their apps.nsc.org credentials it could be really useful that they have a standardized name uh, for elementary if their families help them sign in uh, rather than having people join from just as like whatever they call themselves, but it's really about procedures that you want to have set up. Um, require passwords when scheduling, definitely worth having that on. Just remember to advertise that password uh, in Google Classroom and Seesaw, however you're going to share that out. Um, you want to make sure folks are able to get in. Um, whether you or not you want to have passwords for your PMI or for your instant meetings, that's going to be those next choices. Um, at least for the ones, the ITC consults, I haven't been using for passwords for those. But again, I'm using the waiting room and I'm locking the meetings. So once I have the person that I uh, am meeting with, I see them in the wait room, their name is what it should be, I let them in. And then, you know, I'm not going to let anybody else in after that. So again, layers of security based on what, you, uh, what you're trying to achieve, different ways to get there. But you want to make sure you have something, whether that's locks, passwords, or waiting rooms. Uh, this is an important one, this embed password and meeting link for one-click join. This is, and I think this is probably what Zoom is experiencing right now, is it's a system that's probably mostly built for companies to have conference room conversation, like digital conference room type conversations. You want to make it convenient for people to get in, but by leaving something like that checked, you know, you're giving them the key and the directions. So you could consider unchecking that one and then advertising the password separately. But again, we use weight rooms, lock your rooms. Um, you can still achieve a similar standard of safety. Um, require password for participants joining by phone. Uh, we don't really use the, the by phone feature. So those are, I don't have those uh, checked off. This mute participants upon entry, um, I, because so many of my meetings are with colleagues um, and in smaller groups, I don't, I have, I come in, my waiting room is my filter, I turn on mute participants upon entry, because that's going to happen, I can do that in my participants manager. So this, a lot of this stuff here is like, do you want to have to throw the switch yourself? Which side do you want the switch to be on? I want to, I usually turn this on. If I was teaching, if I was, you know, a classroom teacher, I'd probably check this one because I would rather uh, unmute people uh, than not. So this might be one that you would check if you're going to have like a large groups of people joining all the time. Like if, if I was always doing these webinars, like more often than not, I would probably have that one checked. Uh, getting down into this is some some areas that I think you know when we're especially when we're working with students we might want to consider um, whether we allow it or not you know obviously in a webinar I think that letting people uh, chat with each other might have value um, so I've got that checked if I was with students probably by default I'm going to turn that off again it's something that we can control meeting by meeting but a lot of these settings here we want to just be thinking about if I forget to turn this thing off does it expose me to a bad situation? Would I rather have to allow uh, more permission, you know, or would I rather have to remember to restrict it? So 
Uh, same with chat here. Do you want to allow it at all? That's going to be something allowing meeting participants to send a message visible to all participants. Again, it might be something that you consider turning off. Auto saving classroom um, usage, especially if you're going to be doing discussions in there or you want to allow chat, but you want to make sure that you don't have to remember to save it, which again, you can do at the end. Um, but if you want it to automatically happen, that's a nice one to have turned on. File transfer, again, because I'm working with doing consults with people, I've got that one turned on. I might turn that off if I was with, in a, um, working with students because I would be concerned about what they could post uh, on the run. Um, so that might be something to turn off. I don't think the feedback one is too important, but um, this co-hosting one, this is something that I highly encourage you to turn on because um, it gives a lot of utility, especially I know there's, there's grades um, where you know, all the second grade teachers are teaching together. You definitely wanna be able to give co-host functionality, um, and it's, but it's something you have to turn on ahead of time. Like it's a feature you might not even know exists uh, unless you saw it in the settings here. Uh, when you schedule your meetings, you can name alternative hosts. Uh, those become co-hosts. So in this case, I arrived in this meeting before Shelby. She had named me as an alternative host, and that's how I ended up being the host of this thing. She came in, she becomes a co-host. So it's a really useful feature to have turned on, especially when you're teaching with multiple people. Um, polls, again, something to turn on. You don't have to use it, but it's a, it's a newer feature that uh, Zoom is rolling out. It's only some of these little information boxes, they tell you things like it only works on the desktop client. So um, it might not be something that all your, your students can use if they're on mobile or if they're on Chromebooks. Um, check to make sure that it's something that they actually can use. And you'll see that in these information bars. These ones are, are great, uh, allow hosts to put attendee on hold. Definitely wanna have that turned on. Um, it essentially like you can bump a person out into you know like a little bit of limbo as a, I mean, almost like a digital timeout. Um, these just have to do with like, do you wanna see your controls while you're screen sharing? Not really related to security. Um, these, this one, definitely a big thing for security and making sure that, I know I've talked to teachers where they get their screen sharing taken over by students. So who can start sharing when someone else is sharing? I don't want my students to be able to bump me off of my presentation by putting up whatever they have. Even if they have something valuable to share, I don't want them to like knock me off. So I'm gonna leave that as host only. I can allow them by you know, unshare myself and then they can share. So that's kind of the system I have right now is who can share. The kids are welcome, the students are welcome to share, but I, if I'm sharing, they can't bump me. But you can see if I turn this to host only, host only, well, great, then they can't share. And that might be something to do too. Uh, annotations and whiteboards, like do you want participants to be able to do that? Um, prob probably, you could, so you can have that on. That's gonna be something that they can do when they screen share. It's a really useful feature um, if they're gonna be allowed to, to use those too. I don't think it really presents a security issue. This remote control though, this is giving someone else the ability to control your cursor. I think if you're working with a lot of students, that's a good one to have uh, turned off. You have to allow someone else to do it. So maybe just be aware that it's there. When you do a screen sharing, you'll see, a screen share, you'll see it, but just you know, be uh, cognizant that that option exists. Uh, down here, the uh, allow remove participants to rejoin. Um, I think that, it's up to you as far as like, do you, you know, do you want them to be able to rejoin? I think it's, you know, might be useful to say, to uncheck that one and just bump somebody over to the waiting room. That's going to be a feature that we'll see in a little bit. Um, but because otherwise, if you have that, um, sorry, if you have this one turned on, then they could just keep coming back. The good thing about the waiting room is, is you can just leave them there. Um, but Depends on how you're gonna use removing students or removing people. If you want removal to mean time out, but I have this unchecked so they can come back, but I feel like that's probably something that you don't wanna have checked because if you remove somebody, especially in a Zoom bombing situation, you want them to stay gone. Uh, 
let's see, scroll down here. Security related ones. Here we go. Make sure you have, I think that this waiting room, we're, um, this right now, and actually Zoom just sent out an email saying that this will now be turned on by default as of um, the 2nd of April. So, but I would encourage you to turn it on, you know, before that. It's super powerful. It means that folks, you know, end up in this, in a holding area where they can, you know, you can filter them there. Um, you can let people in, you can message the room and say, hey, I need everybody to rename them themselves to their student names um, before I let people in. And if you, let's say, okay, you've got someone who's trying to Zoom bomb you, you know, they're gonna have to rename themselves to want to a recognizable student's name for you to get tricked into letting them in. And, you know, theoretically you'd see two of the same student if that happened, if they even knew students in your, in your area. Or, you know, if you see somebody who's named themselves Dr. Reed, you know, you could email that person and say, hey, I see you sit in my waiting room or message it and say, hey, can you just email me and let me know that you wanna join my room? Um, it's a good filter to be able to make sure that the people who are in that waiting room are the people you actually want to be admitted into your, um, into your sessions. And then we get down to things like down here, um, the email notifications and then you know, down into some scheduler areas, which I don't think have as much impact on security. Uh, there's a, just a couple things here in recording, just to shout out um, whether you're going to uh, allow other folks to record, um, and, but this mostly has to impact with your desktop. So uh, there's that audio transcript that we're gonna try out for this uh, from an accessibility standpoint, you might consider turning that on and we'll see you know, how that one uh, comes together. Okay, so Shelby, I think that does it for the uh, settings rundown. So I think I'm gonna okay. pull my share here. Are you grabbing the slideshow? Oh yeah, sure, I can put that up. Sorry, apparently I have an airplane flying overhead as well. Oh no. I know. I've got a, <laughs> a, a Zoom bomber but airplane. That's weird. <laughs> okay, present this. Captions. So Pete just took us through pretty much every setting that you want to pay attention to in Zoom. And Pete, is it going to pick up my captions or should I? Oh, I had them turned on. Yeah, they're at the top. Oh, it's, it's grabbing you, but not me. Oh. Uh. <laughs> huh. Well, we'll just see. So we'll just leave that we'll just leave that caption and see if the the audio transcript helps us out um so pete just took you through every setting that help might may help you be proactive when it comes to preventing um misbehavior and misuse of of tools within zoom disruptions to your class and so on and so forth um the reality is you can do all these things and our kids are still going to be clever people out in the wild are still going to be clever and figure out um, ways to be disruptive. It happens. So um, one thing we want to be sure that folks are doing is emphasizing good digital citizenship and responsible use with your classes before you go too far down the road of having um, uh, Zoom classrooms and Zoom sessions, office hours, and so on and so forth. So it's a good reminder for all families to um, maybe get an email from you or some sort of communication within your chosen platform about our um, uh, digital citizenship and responsible use procedure. Um, that is an adopted school board procedure. It's called 2022P. It's on the district website. You can point people to it. Um, it's really important that folks understand what is expected of them, both um, as a student and as staff members, as far as uh, using technology in the district. Beep, it'll be like a film strip. Um, a couple of points about that. One is that, um, you know, because this is a procedure and because this is in the Rights and Responsibilities Handbook for all students, it's important that students understand that there could be disciplinary consequences, um, despite the fact that they're not on school grounds. They're still, quote unquote, at school when they're with you in a Zoom classroom. And so it's important for them to understand the consequences of 
misusing technology. Um, your teacher librarian at your school has been sort of the champion of digital citizenship um, for several years now as we adopted Common Sense Media's digital citizenship and digital literacy curriculum. And it's about five years old now. Um, we were actually in the midst of uh, doing a curriculum refresh for that um, program when the COVID virus hit. So interestingly enough, um, if you uh, feel so inclined, you could certainly go to Common Sense Media's website and review the curriculum material there and use some of that material with your students. You could send them um, links to the online lessons there. You could send them to, there's a program called Digital Passport that's really great. Um, Google has its own digital citizenship curriculum, which is also very great. It's called Be, be Internet Awesome. Um, these would all be great things to have your students be looking at, um, particularly in this time where having structured face-to-face -face time is not necessarily an option. And it reinforces um, our expectation that kids are good digital citizens and staff too, for that, for that matter. Beep. <laughs> Here are some um, things to share with your families and with your students to help ensure good citizenship in your classroom. Um, we've talked a little bit about appropriate screen names. Students should, we recommend that students use their first name only. We also recognize that there might be two Sams in your class. So first name, last initial is an appropriate screen name. Um, the reason for that is as you post recordings or as students are exposed to, you know, other student information in these Zoom environments, um, leaving off last names and other sort of more specific information about students just protects them in case there's a privacy issue. Um, students who have inappropriate screen names should be removed from your class or um, as we'll show you in just a minute, you can rename them and prevent them from renaming themselves. Um, and then there should certainly be some sort of appropriate consequence for that sort of activity. Clothing should be appropriate. As I said at the beginning of our webinar today, um, uh, clothing that students are wearing in Zoom rooms should be school appropriate. Um, there should be no, you know, t-shirts with slogans on them advertising alcohol or drugs. There should be, you know, whatever your school dress code is in terms of coverage and things like that. Um, it should be appropriate in a Zoom room as well. And it bears repeating to families as I think for some of us, even as professionals, it's easy to become more casual when you're working from home or learning from home. So they should just be appropriate for school. Um, backgrounds should also be appropriate. Um, neutral walls or um, even a virtual background, if you allow that in your classrooms, should be appropriate to the environment. Uh, there shouldn't be any revealing content. There shouldn't be any, you know, suggestive, again, advertisements or anything like that. Um, kids are clever and find interesting ways to put things in that are distracting without using their voice or chat. So. Um, pay attention to backgrounds and make sure that your students know what's expected of them. And then interactions within those Zoom rooms are also appropriate and, or should also be appropriate and you should remind students and families what those expectations are. Um, chats and verbal responses within a classroom, other uh, interactions between students um, should all be appropriate to the school environment. Uh, you do have some options uh, in terms of recourse for when things go awry. <laughs> when students don't meet those expectations. Um, you can remove students from your Zoom room, from your classroom, um, and you do also have the option, I think Pete went through it before, you have the option to not allow them to rejoin. Um, the only time when it makes sense to uh, allow a kicked out participant to rejoin might be if you inadvertently kick out the wrong person, but um, in most cases, if you're kicking somebody out, you know who they are and it's intentional. So my suggestion would be to not allow uh, folks to rejoin. And it's not on this slide, but you can also, um, we'll talk about this in a minute, um, locking the room as soon as you know that everybody's there is a good way to kind of prevent things from, prevent other kids from other classes from joining or preventing um, you know, some of those disruptive behaviors as well. Um, if you can, uh, I know everybody's busy and maxed out and things are really crazy right now, but if you can find a buddy to be your co-host, having a co-host is one of the most um, freeing things as a Zoom presenter. Um, you can task your co-host with looking at chat, just as Pete and I are doing for each other today. You can task your co-host with letting people in from the waiting room so that you can be focused on the good instruction. Um, you can have the host be monitoring 
um, you know, people's backgrounds and things like that. And then maybe renaming students or, you know, doing those things that, um, that free you up to let you focus on good instruction. You can certainly get your principal involved um, as you uh, find ways to loop them in. Maybe ask them once in a while to be a co-host for you. It's a good way for them to um, have a presence in your instruction. And also, um, if things go awry, they're there as a, a resource. And as you record your classes, um, being sure to share those recordings with your principal when you think that there's been an issue with misbehavior gives them an excellent record and some sort of forensic evidence to help decide what that appropriate consequence should be. And then again, record the meeting. There's in this latest version of North Shore Learns 2.0, the only situation you should not record is a one-on-one -on -one interaction with a student where um, it's audio only and you're not providing an SLP, uh, OTPT, or special ed related service. Um, in all other circumstances, you should be recording because it memorializes the lesson for those kids that can't attend synchronously. And it also provides a record of any interactions, positive or negative, that happened during the class. So record, record, record. And if you're worried about those recordings um, taking up space on your computer, put them in your Google Drive. Make a folder, name the recording, you know, class lesson, blah, 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 subject on blah, blah, blah date. Throw it in a folder in Google Drive. And um, from there, you can actually post it in a variety of places in Google Classroom and Seesaw um, and so on. And if you're not posting a particular recording, you still have access to it to be able to share it with a principal. So recording is really important. I'm gonna let Pete take over these next couple of slides and talk through some of the in-meeting settings, which we can't show you while we're in a meeting because the Zoom window disappears. So we've done some screenshotting here for you. Yeah, this will be a good spot to maybe refer back to in the recording is, uh, there, and here I can bring back our captions. Um, because unfortunately, some of these options you'll see, or at least the locations where they live, you might see, but because you're not hosts on the meeting, you won't be able to replicate it here. So when you go back to your own sessions, you'll see these features. But we'll kind of break this into different chunks across the next few slides. So this is these instructions here are based on the uh, participants list. So when you look at, if you're you know, presenting, um, you should have, next to the share button, the share screen button, a manage participants, or in your case, as, a, as just a participant in this meeting, you have something, I think it's just called the participants, but for hosts, we have manage participants. And in that list, we would have uh, folks that are, and you can see in our screenshot, Shelby is the host, I'm the co-host, and then we have, um, we have a third person here who's just a participant. When you hover over someone who is a participant, you get a mute button and a more button. And the more button is where these things in our picture are coming from. So chat directly with them. Um, stop video is a powerful one if you want, uh, if they are sharing and you decide that what they're sharing is not something that should be shared, uh, you can stop that. Um, you, there's remove at the bottom, like if this is a Zoom bomber, by all means, just kick them out. But if you think it's just a student that you know, you're know you gonna be following up with in the session and resetting expectations and stuff like that, you can stop the video. Also, the stop the video is nice to be able to, uh, to start and stop people screen sharings. There's, that becomes ask to start video if the person isn't sharing. So that's a nice one to be able to, uh, to just toggle on and off. Uh, the next one, spotlight video. This, can, this is a really useful one to, it focuses everyone's screen on the same person. So if you say you called on a student to show their work, if everyone's writing on a piece of paper in front of them, you might have them hold that up to the camera. Uh, I had a session earlier today with uh, DJ Jacobson at North Creek. She teaches ASL and she needs students to be able to sign in ASL back to the group. So if she spot, if she calls on a student by spotlighting them, the student, everyone can see that student's reply because otherwise Zoom is looking for someone who's talking to show. If you just leave it in active speaker mode, people are only gonna see who's talking and who's talking might be 
you know, someone who's not actually on task, might be someone whose dog is barking, like all that kind of thing. So the spotlight just pulls everybody to, to a single person. Spotlight becomes like cancel spotlight as well. You can see the escalations there, make host, make co-host. So when you're setting up your room beforehand, again, if you're all the second grade teachers at Wooden and you're all teaching together, maybe you're gonna um, have, you know, make each other co-host before you let the students in from the weight room. And that's where that happens. The rename button is there. So if you need to manually rename someone, you can do it. That's um, put them in the waiting room. I think that's a useful one if there's, if you need a timeout type function that isn't just kicking the person out, you can put them in the waiting room. You know, if somebody changed their, uh, changes their name and you need them to make that name appropriate, if you just need to give somebody a break, you can put them in the waiting room. You can message the waiting room too. So you can say, hey, you're, you're in the waiting room because of this, you gotta do this, and then I'll let you back in. Um, so useful, and then obviously remove is just that they're out. Uh, what we're showing you in the right-hand view is if you use the gallery view, so when you're looking at, your, at the active speaker by default, so you can probably all see my screen being shared right now, but if you went to that grid, um, icon and look and so you can see everybody everybody all the speakers all the videos have a little cartouche on its side these three dots and those same features in the participants menu are in that view so as a teacher if you're in gallery view because you want to keep an eye on everybody and kind of like Apara, you want to go over there and click on that three dots and put the person in the waiting room um, you can do it here or you can go over to the participants menu and do it over there, um, depending on how you have everything set up. So just trying to keep those really important features very closely within your reach. Okay, so this next uh, set of screenshots here, or this next screenshot has to do with giving uh, controls in your screen share. So the, play, the way I'm getting to these is, um, if you're not screen sharing, and you, and I mean, I think all of you can probably see this button right now, um, next to your participants before your chat, you should have a green button that says screen share. There's an arrow right next to it. When you click on that, you get this, um, this little pop-up that says one participant can share at a time, multiple can share simultaneously, and then advance. What I'm showing you in the white box is the advanced part. And you can see that those probably, those should look really familiar because those are the same ones that were up in my zoom.us web browser settings. And so to my point of up there on the web page is usually where you set defaults that can then be adjusted in the meeting as needed. So when you realize like, oops, I allowed my participants to share and I really don't want to let them share, this is how you fix that. Or vice versa, if you, only wanted the host to share, and then you got to the end of the lesson, and you are going to let people show their work, uh, then you could adjust those settings there. So that's just in that pop-up. Um, and again, I would definitely leave that who can start sharing when someone else is sharing. I would uh, make sure that students aren't able to bump me off. Just got well, somebody in the waiting room I'm going to let in. All right. This is uh, managing all participants. So this is at the bottom of your participants list. Um, most of these features are gonna only show up to hosts, um, but this is the more area of the participants menu. So you've got a list of uh, mute all, unmute all, and then you have this more button. Um, this has some of your really important features like um, muting participants on entry. Again, remember that was a setting that we had up in our defaults on zoom.us, but if we forgot to turn it on or we want to turn it off, here's the opportunity to do that, allowing participants to unmute themselves. Again, we set it as a default, but we can correct it. Um, if you are allowing people to just, to just come in without an a, waiting room, which again, I don't know why you would do that. Uh, you might want to have an enter and exit chime so that you're aware that somebody came in. But again, I would, uh, I think that waiting room one is a nice one to have checked off. Uh, allowing participants to rename themselves. Maybe. 
Uh, but there's that checkbox there. Again, you probably, I would probably not be allowing that, um, especially if folk, but if you, you could have a standard where, okay, everybody's in the waiting room. They're, the class expectation is that they rename themselves to something recognizable. Then you let them in and you've checked the box that says, or you've unchecked that. You don't want them to be able to rename themselves anymore. And, you know, so you gave them the opportunity to, you know, write their names on their digital name tags. And now you've taken away the markers. Lock the meeting. I think this came up in the questions and I said I would shout this out for someone. Uh, that is the no one can enter no matter what. They're not, whether they were authorized, whether they were invited, they can't come in once you lock that meeting. Um, if you're using a waiting room, I guess it's, uh, I can imagine a scenario where I've, I've, you know, have the waiting room, but then I unchecked it. The lock, I was, I was working with an OTP this, OTPT this morning, and I would, I think the lock feature is kind of a really nice security feature. If you've got an IEP up here, you're meeting with a parent, and you just want to be 100% sure that nobody's going to like walk into your meeting and see an IEP up, well then lock the door, and that's how you do it digitally. Uh, all, this is off of that manage participants button again. Uh, this has to do with uh, where you're able. Um, yeah, sorry, I was just looking at the chat. Um, this is where you're all able to change things. I've got, I've got manage participants here, but the right hand side more has to do with chats. Um, message the waiting room. This is going to live up at the top of your participants bar. Um, that you should have the ability to message the waiting room. So you can see in our example, I've got this kind of generic name called instructional technology. And if I saw a student join, or if I saw someone join my class and they had a name like, you know, Chromebook 75 or instructional technology, I would message the waiting room and say, hey, I see I've got someone in the waiting room that has, you know, a name that isn't reflective of a student in my class. Would you please rename yourself? Uh, Otherwise, I won't be able to let you in. If they don't, you could remove them or leave them there, but at least you know they're kind of safe from, uh, you know, making an issue for you, assuming they even were. Uh, over on the right, this is the bottom right of your chat uh, abilities. So if you're looking at the chat, you should see three dots down there. Uh, you might have the ability to save chat, but you're not going to have those other ones. This is just, again, we set defaults in zoom.us. If you want to change those in, you know, as live in your meeting, there they are. So you've got to the a point where you do want students to be able to uh, share some discussion ideas. Maybe you change it to everyone publicly. You pose a question, you want students to be able to answer, but you would choose everyone publicly and then you turn that off. Um, and again, it comes with good behavior expectations. It comes with good classroom management. Um, and I'm sure it'll come with some hiccups if you decide to do that, but the option is there. Uh, and then I think, yep, yeah, cool. So I believe I saw some, I just had an eye peeled on the chat there. Um, I'll leave up our contact information here as well as a plug for booking an appointment with an ITC to work out some more of these settings and try things out. But Shelby, I think I saw some questions maybe that we're gonna, we wanted to address from the chat. Um, yeah, there was one question that I wasn't sure of the answer to, and I've answered so many questions since then, that I don't remember what it was. Oh, it was from Rachel. Um, she wanted to know if you message the waiting room, can students either individually or whatever, can they message back? And I thought the answer was no. Yeah, I, I have not seen that. Um, okay. I don't think it's possible for the message, and I mean, it's probably a good thing. I wish, I kind of wish you could. Um, I Like right now, Maddie's in the waiting room. I don't think I can go and find her in the list and message her. I have to message the whole room. So here, I'll let Maddie in. But my only option is to message the whole waiting room. It's nice from a perspective, we use it a lot, you've probably seen it in our webinars where we, you know, the four of us, uh, the ITCs get into a session, we, someone drops a message into the waiting room that's just like, hey, everybody sit tight, we'll have you in here in just a minute. Um, you know, 
you'll want to, and maybe we like get, tell people which website they might want to have open or something like that. But it does go to everyone. Um, and unfortunately, they cannot message back. Um, Jessica just confirmed that she tried this morning and they cannot message back. Uh, uh, and Kevin asked, can people in the waiting room hear the lesson? No, that's the point of the waiting room. You get to yeah. stay there until we let you in. Yeah, I think you probably all experienced it as you were waiting. If you, if you arrived early for this session, Shelby and I were in there, you know, 10 or 15 minutes beforehand, putting up our slides and, you know, figuring out our talking points and stuff like that. And you couldn't hear us. And it's by design. Yeah. Um, there was a good question. <laughs> Sorry. There was a really good, really good question to ask. Hold on. Hey. Here, I'll read off a couple of questions. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to answer a question about attendance, which I thought was really, really good. And I hope people I hope people um, got a chance to see this in the chat. But um, somebody asked, well, how, can you talk about how to take attendance with Zoom? And one of the lovely things about the waiting room is that you can treat it like you're letting kids in one at a time taking attendance. Yeah. So if you've got, maybe you've got a little paper copy of your class list or whatever, and as you're letting kids in, you can just check them off and be like, here, 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 here. Everybody's in the room. I'm going to lock it. I'm going to mute everybody. Uh, and you know, have all my settings good to go. And now my attendance is done and away we go. I'm going to mute uh, myself and let Pete talk. Just to, I want to sh I see Toby answered this in the chat, um, along with innumerable other things. And again, I thank you SDSs, ITCs, other folks who know Zoom really well at this point. Uh, we couldn't have answered all these questions without you. Um, but yes, those, there's like the slow down, speed up, yes, no. It's called nonverbal feedback. It was a setting that I failed to mention when I scrolled down through all those settings. I mean, it's not really a security thing, um, but it's definitely a cool feature. So it was in that long list of settings. Uh, just if you search for feedback, you find it really quickly. Um, let's see, what if a student gets dropped during the session and the class is locked? Uh, that is one of the risks of locking and one of the benefits of, you is, of using the waiting room. So you will see them in the waiting room. Um, if you lock it, they just get a message that says it's locked. So yeah, I mean, knowing that people have, you know, my, so I know Toby and I experienced this, this today, if Frontier goes down for three minutes, then and you get kicked out of your meeting and they lock the door, then you're not getting back in. So another plug for waiting rooms. Um, hey, Pete, somebody asked how you generate a participant list. Like if you didn't want to do the one at a time attendance greeting kind of thing as kids entered the yeah. room, how do you do that? Um, I believe that it is in the, you have to pull it from reports. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right about that. So, and I haven't, I have wanted to use reports more, um, but I do see Kelly there says in the report tool and then keep scrolling until you get to it. Yeah. So. It is in the, if you go to zoom.us, I was in settings, but I think just a couple spots down was report and uh, it's in there. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. And I think some quick ones for attendance would be part of my first reason to go into that area. Uh, does this generate a list of anyone who, yes, it does, which is great because it, Sometimes, you know, if, you, if at any given point, like in this meeting, I know at one point we had more than 100 participants, and I'm sure some people had to go and some people had arrived late. And if in a webinar, maybe that doesn't matter, but in a class, it certainly does. And so those reports are gonna be really powerful. Yeah, there you go. So at one point we had 113. And yeah, for sure, if, my, if I just had students as they were coming in the waiting room, check off that they are there and then they left and I didn't notice, the report is what's gonna let me know that. Uh, reports, Nick, is in zoom.us, so go to the website as if you're going to your profile or your settings, should be in the list there. Um, in case uh, some folks missed this earlier in the chat, if you, if at any point you didn't see some of the settings in your setup that Pete was going through, it could be because you need your account upgraded. You could be among the few folks that are left that still haven't had that happen. 
So to resolve that, you can email any of the tech coordinators or me with how you log into Zoom, whether it's through Google using your apps.nsd.org account or your general nsd.org email. Um, and then when we know that, we'll upgrade your account and you should get an email to confirm it and you should be good to go. And then all those settings open up to you that you weren't seeing before. I see the question. Yep, Nancy, thank you for answering that one. Um, yeah, I think uh, Ann Cargill asked where the, where do your chats go? Where do your recordings go? Um, they go to documents, Zoom, then a folder. So in your finder, documents, Zoom, a folder is created that is the date of your meeting, date and time, and then it'll all be in there. So it's not, when you save it, it'll actually bring up a little box that says click here and you and it'll take you right to it. But you'll learn, I mean, if you're using it a lot, you'll learn it pretty quickly. It's just within your documents folder. Um, how to move a recording to Google Classroom. Uh, if you record to the Zoom cloud, which you have the ability to do if you're in the pro licensed version, you can grab a link from the Zoom cloud and post it, you know, as a material in Google Classroom. If you downloaded the file, you could put it on uh, Google Drive. It takes a long time, but once it's uploaded, you could link to it in Google Classroom. I think I leveraged that Zoom cloud, though. Yeah, um, there were some chats earlier, too, about, um, especially with longer class meetings, uh, the amount of time it takes for Google to process those files. It does, yeah. it does sometimes take a bit. It can be a little bit laggy. One other option for folks is to move those files into YouTube as unlisted videos. It's important not to list them. If you make them public, then you're opening up some possible student security issues. So um, you could put them in YouTube as unlisted videos and then link to them from your variety of platforms. Yep. Um, yeah, I have seen that, Nick. The, you know, it, does, it times out. You try to lower the, the resolution and it still takes forever. So YouTube would be great. And then, yeah, of course, you can put stuff up to Seesaw the same way. I believe the Zoom Cloud does have a data limit, and I don't think that, yeah, it's not a lot. So I think you're going to be, an, if you're trying to save all your lectures, um, they're all your classes, you're probably going to end up in YouTube pretty quickly. Uh, Nick, YouTube problems. Once we verify, yes, you got to verify the accounts, because uh, you're otherwise you get a 15 minute limit. There's a good question from Jennifer Morley about recording the gallery view, because you do have options for what gets recorded, whether it's um, just the shared screen or the shared screen in the gallery view or just the gallery view or something like that. Um, or I think the active speaker, there's an option for just active speaker. Um, your recording settings might depend on what you're asking students to do in the class. So I would think about that before you start up your class and set your recordings accordingly. <laughs> Um, if what you really want to share, uh, you know, after the class is over is really just the screen sharing and there's not a lot of maybe student interactivity, then your um, recording could just be of the shared screen without the video of the students, which um, increases security and privacy for those students. Um, there were, uh, I had a couple of interactions with folks earlier today about students that have um, that have opted out of directory information or that maybe have custody issues or privacy issues that uh, where they wouldn't want their student's name or video, if you will, exposed in any recording or Zoom room. And um, that's where some of those recording issues can be really helpful. If you're just recording the, um, the shared screen or you're doing a screencast, maybe later after the fact, uh, without the student video, then that's um, that can be really helpful. The other thing to consider might be having any students with those privacy concerns keep their video off and changing maybe their screen name to something um, that prevents people from knowing, you know, much about that student. These are all, there's a variety of ways to make sure that kids' um, privacy is protected, particularly in those custody issues or those other sorts of privacy issues. Yeah, student ID would be okay. Uh, there's a question there about um recordings did not not showing student faces at all um 
Shelby, I feel like I heard you mention that a while back that it, like blurring out people's faces or is it just leaving them off? Sorry, dog. Um, so I think that that is in the, <laughs> the recording settings. You can, that's where you can record just the screen that oh, okay. you're sharing versus um, students. Hey, yeah. you're all fired. Um, there's, also, there's also some settings. I don't remember. I was looking at chats. So I don't remember if you went through this, Pete, but there's also some settings that let you turn off display names or not display yeah. names of students, which also could be another security prevention, you know, or privacy issue. And if I remember right, that's in the, uh, in the settings for that, the desktop app. I think you're right about that. Yeah. So that is something to keep in mind too, is there are more settings in your desktop app. So you'll, that's another place to go to check out um, some of these, these, uh, some of these recording settings. Um, hide non-video participants, yeah, that one. Okay, let me see, we'll catch up on the chat. <laughs> I can't point my camera at the talkie doggo. <laughs> because I booted the Taki Doggos out to the waiting room, so. How do I put the desktop app on my desktop? So it's an application in your application folder called zoom.us. It's like a blue uh, square-ish thing with rounded corners and a white camera in it. It, lit, it should be installed on your machine. It should have been pushed out to your machine before we left campuses. Um, if it's in your applications folder, you can just drag it out into your dock. Um, or once you've opened it, you just command click on it and you can say like pin to menu or um, options, keep, yeah, keep on dock. No. When you go to the record icon, oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks Beth for answering a question there. Um, I feel like we're sort of petering out of questions. Uh, <laughs> and I so realize we're also at the end of our scheduled time. Um, okay. I'm certainly happy to continue taking questions, but it does seem like we are maybe hitting the end of it, right? Yeah, I will just put uh, put another plug in for booking an appointment with your tech coordinator or with me. Um, we're happy to provide one on one support if you want to go through your settings. Um, we had a couple of appointments this week where entire departments or grade levels met with a coordinator, which seems to be a really effective way to um, get a little, you know, special custom session for your grade level, especially if you're trying to remain consistent across your department. So um, do reach out, book an appointment. The um, 7789 instructional tech number is no longer taking calls. We've moved to this appointment system. So if you're looking for that support, um, how to kind of support, be sure to book an appointment. If you're having technical issues, do call 6688. They are taking calls at tech support. Shelby, we just had a few questions that either we had missed or um, get floated up here. And yeah. one, I, there's a kind of a two-parter here, I think, from Sharon Maynor and Nancy Nigrid using personal phones app even if it's the app i mean i i'm never sure exactly what the discovery situation is here but i mean this is all in the cloud i don't think so there's, there's i don't know that there's any way to record anything locally to a mobile device yeah so um the only the only action you're getting on that mobile device is a connection to the the meeting that's in the cloud. So nothing's stored on the device other than the app, mm -hmm. which is just a doorway to get to somewhere else. So I, I would not have any reservations yeah. about using a personal device to access a meeting or even host a meeting for that sense, as long as you're recording to the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly, I use my phone and my, well, then certainly my work iPad quite a bit for testing. Like if I need two participants so I can test out some features, I use it quite a bit. Um, and yeah, it's just connects to the, to the, the tool. Uh, I see a question, what's the best way to leave your screen for a moment? I mute my video or turn off my, stop my video and mute my audio. Mm -hmm. um, select break, I don't know. What's break? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not familiar with, with 
with there being another choice. Um, um, one option might be um, if you've pre-created uh, a Google slide deck is to build in a break slide and then have that be sharing, turn off your video, turn off your audio, mute all participants and, you know, give them a, a return time, you know, maybe even on embedded on the slide or um, embed a, a timer. There's lots of timers, YouTube based video timers that you can embed in a Google slide that you can run so that people know when they need to be back. Um, but again, keeping everybody muted, um, making sure your chat settings are good allows you to share that slide and step away without all hell breaking loose in the chat. So I see, uh, you know, a couple of folks mentioned there's, a, you know, the, well, one person mentions the coffee cup and then an option under participants. I see that as part of the feedback settings and that would be like, I need a break. Um, like if I put up the coffee cup, that would signal to the host like, hey, I need a big break, but I don't see an option that is, uh, yeah, it, it even says that it, when you hover over it. So oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I think like, yeah, so building them in and muting and stopping video would be great. Um, I feel like there was a couple things that maybe, nice way to take care of your audio. Oh, if we can read this chat after you are finished. Uh, yes, we are gonna save off the chat um but as far as posting it it would be a document i mean it's they're not pretty the chat yeah. transcripts are really terrible they're really ugly um <laughs> i have had some success um actually clicking in the chat window and doing a select all which gets you everything in the chat in a little nicer format than the actual transcript um it i don't think it picks up it may not pick up private chats between another co-host and a participant but it would catch everything that you had access to and that and again it looks prettier and if you've turned off private chats or you've turned off the ability for you know individual chats or whatever then that select all and copy paste into a google doc could work pretty well uh, last question i just came across there is and i think toby's addressed it is the joining multiple meetings it's a beta feature. Zoom turned it on for us at our own request. Um, but yeah, it's not going to be flawless. Uh, and <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, I was doing that today, actually. I had Sarah, I was in a meeting with Sarah in one window, and I was in a meeting with Pete in the other window, and Pete could hear Sarah, and Sarah could hear Pete, but they couldn't uh -huh. see each other. And it was like, what is happening? <laughs> it was strange. Uh, Jeff asked about polling. I think. Uh, it would it is i used it once and it's surprisingly complex like you could actually have quizzes in there um i don't know if, if i was using google classroom though and i could just lob out a question that way i think i'd probably stick with what i know um or if i'm someone who likes kahoot i'd probably go with that um I'm not sure if I would expect this to work in such an academic fashion as some of those tools I'm already using, but that's all based on the fact that I don't have a lot of experience with it. Oh, there you go. So Beth says she's, or it works for a quick one or two question check-in. Yeah. Uh, break rooms, I would encourage you to check out the webinar I did about that. It's on the Zoom page, on the blended learning page. It's, it's pretty, you know, it's 20 minutes or so. Um, but it's, they're cool, they're really powerful. Um, definitely put them to use, but I'll save them from off of, you know, for that webinar. And then book an appointment with us if you wanna take a deeper dive into those. Lisa's question. Um, I might be missing Lisa's question. Oh. Okay, I'm wondering if this is a bad question, but I truly need to know if I co-teach with a SPED teacher and have a number of mid-level students, should I not be recording? Um, Shelby, I might defer to you there. I don't know why you would not record. The only circumstance that I'm aware of where we are not recording is a one-on-one -on -one between a general ed teacher and a student where there is no video. 
co-teaching with a special ed teacher um, puts two adults in the room. So it's automatically not a one-on-one. -on -one. And if you're co-teaching in a classroom, even more reason to record the lesson because that would be memorializing the lesson for the students that couldn't attend synchronously. So you should be recording. Uh, teachers should not have a one-on-one -on -one during open office hours, right? That's not correct. One-on-ones are fine. Um, again, unless uh, SLP, OTPT related services, um, those one-on-ones should not be recorded, but they could certainly be during open office hours. Next I, I don't know what the recording record thumbnails when sharing. <laughs> I don't right. know what that means. It's the it's the it's the participants, right? Maybe I don't know. I don't know why that would be different than, you know, the gallery view, speaker view, and all those different options. Yeah. Okay, I see Toby. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we were I'm so glad we have a bunch of STSs in the room there. Yeah. Uh, we were under the impression that it should only be audio one to one. Correct. That that is Amy Lynn's quoting the. Um, the document, the North Shore Learns 2.0 document. One-on-ones should be only audio unless SLP, OTPT, psych related services. That's my understanding. That's the guidance as of today. That it's only audio in those in those other circumstances and it should not be recorded. Yes, Mary, I believe you can. There is a split screen, it's in the settings. Um, yeah, I think trying to pre-record a lesson. Uh, Maddie put up a great video, uh, well, some options about screencasting. Um, I think I have one up there that has to do with screencasting with Zoom. And I mean, all the same rules would apply, just add somebody else to the mix, then you could definitely record ahead of time. Okay. This has been really fun. I think this is my first uh, webinar I've co-taught with Pete. I appreciate your co-hostness. Oh yeah, right back at you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. High five over there, <laughs> wherever you are. Elbow bump. Elbow, elbow five, that's right. <laughs> All right, All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks We're gonna be posting much. this recording to the Blended Learning website and um, there you will find a bazillion other resources as well. So that's it, we're done. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Go be with your family. <laughs> Shall we end, Pete? Should we kick them out? Yeah, and uh, I think we're both recording, but I guess- I don't think I, I'm, well, mine might be automatically recording because that's my setting. Oh, maybe that's it. I yeah. started mine like two minutes into the session, so it's probably better to use yours and just trim. Okay. Because I think mine's missing like the first sentences. Okay. All right. Okay, well, I saved the chat just in case. Um, if you want to, I think because you came in as the host, you can end the meeting for everybody. Uh, okay, great. I'll stop this. I'll see you for our morning huddle. Yep, yeah, we'll see you there. Oh my God, look at Maddie. This is the first time I've seen oh Maddie's my gosh. quarantine a ween costume. I had my hat on earlier today, but then my, my head started to hurt. I had my, my sorcerer's hat on earlier and um, one of my bookings appointments said, that's so appropriate because this technology is sorcery. It's complete witchcraft. <laughs> like, okay, that's one way to look at it. Um, Bye okay. everybody. I'm uh, out.